There's something about a round ice group. I don't know what sorcery it is, but it definitely keeps your drinks colder longer. Try Hey loves, it's A back on your screen with another one. Hope you're all well. Today we're talking about Atlanta season one, episode five. This was one of the weaker episodes in my opinion. I loved it on first watch years ago, but after seeing what Atlanta is capable of, this is in the bottom three for me. We're gonna get into it. It was still good, just not great. And I wanna hear what you have to say so you know where to leave it. But before we do, I wanna hear from you. Have you seen the Atlanta season four trailer yet? I saw that last week and I lost my ish. I'm so hyped for it. September couldn't come sooner, which is saying a lot cause I'm not big on end of summer. The only thing I have to look forward to this fall is Atlanta. And I'm so hyped because this trailer gave me everything I needed and more. I saw things from the episodes we reviewed so far, so I'm happy that we're going through this and recapping before that drops. They purposely gave us a couple flashbacks as they gave us that acid trip of the characters moving forward. So let me not go too deep with that because I feel like we're gonna do a deep dive with this episode. I don't know how much of a deep dive I should do since I don't even swim that well, but we'll see. We'll see how this goes. So this episode opens up with Alan Earn talking. It looks like they're at a charity event, maybe charity basketball, whatever it may be. The storyline diverts instantly. Usually there's about a two minute buffer. I feel like it's been exactly two minutes, if not less, before we go into different plot lines. If you're new around here, what I like to do to tackle the timeline is to keep the plot line separately because a lot goes on in these episodes. So we're gonna talk about Earn first, then Paperboy's plot line and end with Darius. So after Earn and Darius divert, Earn is mistaken by this character named Janice who seems to be a well-seasoned agent as Alonzo. And I don't know what it is about the name Alonzo, but it's giving me Emily in Paris passionate lover tease. Is that just me? All I do know though, is she's smoking a cigarette inside, which is a no-go. Someone comes up to her to say, you can't do that. But obviously her energy, she's the type of woman who doesn't follow the rules. Let's just call a spade a spade. We've all met that person. We might've worked for that person or worked with that person, but there's people out there that think they're above the ways or above the law. And this is definitely the case with this Janice character. After she refuses to accept that Ern is not Alonzo, she goes upstairs and brings him along to some event. When they get to the door, she walks in because she's already well regarded, she's established, and the gentleman asks for Ern's lanyard. Now, this is where my first deep dive comes in, and I might be reaching. I think Atlanta has this thing where they parallel episodes from different seasons. I discussed this when we reviewed Atlanta season three, episode eight, because it was spookily similar to episode eight of season one. And this is just a small parallel, but do you remember in episode five, season three, Ern was trying to get by and they asked for his ID. And if you go back and watch closely, they let somebody else who is privileged in different ways go through without showing his ID. I'm just saying that to let you know, because by the time we get to season three, Ern is way more established and he should be able to enter doors and move in rooms, pun intended and literally, but we see that there is some dissonance there. So because of Janice and her sly way of saying, oh, the lanyards aren't a look, he's able to access this room that he wouldn't have been able to work without her. So luckily this misinterpretation, this misidentity is working in his favor for now. Ern is now seen talking to two people and at one point they ask him what his artist wants and he's like, my artist wants to make money. And it's so funny because when you make it, it's these statements that are so blatantly obvious that make people laugh, but where they are in this stage in the game, it's so blatantly real and raw. And I think this episode has an undercurrent about what is real, what is authenticity and authenticity. <laughs> How can I struggle on that word when it's the name of my podcast? So I love at the end of the conversation, they even refer him to another person who works in television. And I'm thinking, wow, okay, Ern, you're getting the thumbs up to work the room. You know, they say fake it till you make it. <laughs> 
I was laughing when he got their business cards and he said, you know, I ran out, I was giving them away, but I'll contact. He was feeling himself, you could tell from his facial expressions, he moved to the bar. With a little bit of change he's got, he asked the man, how much is it for a beer? The guy says it's gratis, it's complimentary. So he switches up real quick to a Henny and Grand Marnier. Don't act like you've never done that before. You go somewhere and it's an open bar and you're like, okay. He's drinking, he's sipping slowly and really taking it in. It's almost like he's getting a taster or a sampler of where he could be if he plays his cards right, being Paperboy's manager. This is when things go way left. Janice comes up with weird energy talking about, do you remember what happened six years at the Grammys? And he's like, yes. So now you can see there's a little bit of playing into this character. And this is where Ern trips up. <laughs> this was so stupid and so weird. She begins escalating the situation to the point where she's yelling at this man about swindling her and then walks away. But just before she leaves, she says, I will destroy you. I'm going to make you homeless. And if I know anything about Elena, maybe we should keep an eye for Janice, season four, episode five. I'm just saying I could really see it going down. Maybe again, I'm reaching. Let a girl know I wouldn't be mad, although I wouldn't be happy to see Al go from where he was to where he is in season three to homeless because of Janice. That's not how I want to see the character develop, not that rise and fall, but it'd be really funny if Janice did come back. She might not succeed, but it'd be funny if she came back. Turn weirded out, goes downstairs where Paperboy is, and he's like, are you good to go? Paperboy's like, yeah, for his own reasons, and that's where the episode ends. So now let's talk about Paperboy for a bit, because his... Plot line, I really wasn't here for it. And I usually love owl scenes. I think that, fridge. I love that they gave this character so much dimension, especially for the times and even for this episode. We have this character who goes by a paper boy and owl. There's this duality to him. And as he comes on the onset of this episode, in the first scene, he's trying to, you know, smooth with the female reporter. She's not having it, no parts of it. She shades him, goes off to do some work things, but before she does, she does let him know, uh, my audience is not gonna really be down for you and you're shooting antics. And he tries to kill her file. Oh, well, that's not really how it went down. I don't know if we get to know by the end of the season if there was an alternate story to what happened with the shooting. I can't remember, so you can let me know. All I do know is, this episode was kind of a mess to me. Paperboy is not feeling the Beebs. The Beebs comes in on scene. He's getting all the attention, the adoration. The female reporter fixes herself and starts acting weird, runs to get an interview with him. Meanwhile, Al and Ern are talking about the situation, and Ern lets him know he's very likable. You know, he has everything that the industry wants. And I think this really speaks to pop culture and pop music. Then it's time for Al to switch into his basketball clothes and get ready to play on the charity court. The Beebs is doing what the Beebs does. He's peeing in a corner and people was, I don't know why everyone likes this guy. Meanwhile, the guy beside him is starstruck, talking, smiling, ear to ear, fangirling. And he says something, you know, he's just like a lovable character, that kind of thing. And Paperboy still doesn't get it. And because of this dissonance, of course, when they hit the court, tensions run high, testosterone runs high, and they get into a physical fight, which is not a good look. It's not a good look in general, but not for a charity. I want you guys to bear with me because I try to see this from another perspective and maybe this isn't it. I'm sure the writers probably weren't even looking at it like this, but I wanted to make it symbolic. I saw this as a conflict between different genres in the music industry. We all know that pop is premium, whether you're Michael Jackson or Drake or Justin Bieber. If you're able to make a genre of music transferable to the point where it's considered pop, that is king, quite literally. Now, if you are hip hop or underground or rap or even R&B, those are not promoted and don't get as much play. We can look at even Tierra Marie and Rihanna as an example. Rihanna transcends all music. She's been able to do all genres from country to rock to hip hop. She's just done it all. And because of that, she's considered pop. Whereas someone like Tierra Marie never really went further than hip hop, which can only take you so far in the industry. Even though we can argue nowadays, thanks to Drake and other artists, 
like Kendrick Lamar and J. Cole. Hip hop is now pop because there's so much of hip hop elements in country in R&B, a lot of times when a music succeeds, it does have either that rap hook. Perfect example, Drill and Trap. Need I say more? So seeing the evolution of back in 2016, Justin Bieber was able to commodify different types of music to make it pop or to profit off of it, you could say. And Justin Bieber, like Drake or Chris Brown, has been able to do the Afro beats and the country and the R&B. And I looked at this fight because I didn't want to look at it as a slapstick, stupid, nonsensical scene as Paperboy representing hip hop and the Biebs representing pop. And at the end of it, when they have this conference and he's able to apologize and turn his hat around so it says real, the ability for a pop artist to have more grace when they transgress. That's how I read it. Now again, if your girl is swimming in the deep end, and gasping for air, you can let me know, but that's what I tried to extrapolate from this. Especially when she said, let me give you a piece of advice. They want Bieber to be the good guy. <laughs> Meanwhile, he's in the background dancing like a fool. And I swear that's Donald Glover's voice high pitch, wasn't it? I'm pretty sure it was. But then she goes on to say, you're a rapper, you're the bad guy. And now we begin to see this pigeonholing that again becomes more evident in season three in episode five, for example, where we wonder what was on Paperboy's phone? Was it a ballad? Was it something softer? And even if we use the example that I just said before with Drake, when he was first on the scene as a hip hop artist, a lot of moguls, men, and people in that sphere always joked on him being the light-skinned soft guy. Now he's created a whole genre of guys who've come after him and since then to also have that soft side, that vulnerable side, that toxic but I love you side. It's interesting that the female reporter who represents the media at large is trying to put this person who's an artist who's meant to be evolutionary and revolutionary and evolve constantly into this box of you are a rapper so you are problematic and you just play the bad guy part that's what's going to work for you and it really does beg the question is art imitating life or is life imitating art or is the music industry just commodifying it all i wonder i don't know but before we wrap up this, let's talk about Darius in this episode because that was my highlight. Darius always gives me life. So we see Darius in his room and it's just a crack in the door. I try to zoom in to figure out what was on the walls. I always feel like Atlanta gives you tidbits about things if you really take the time, but I couldn't really read anything on any of the walls. So if I miss something, let a girl know. But as I said in season three, episode nine, you can learn a lot about a person from how they keep their space, their place, their room, whatever it is. I didn't really get a vibe. I don't know if he's like, I can't even tell if that's Darius's room or he's staying by Al, but I guess I'm overthinking in that respect. All I do know is he was carrying one of those art canvases. And I was thinking about the times when I used to go to yoga class and people were like, oh, I thought you were an artist. I'm like, what? Your bag, I'm like, that's a yoga mat in the bag. I don't even think artist canvases come in yoga bags like this. He's walking and I don't remember this. I'm like, where is he going with the art canvas? And then I realized when he's buying a gun with two rounds, they has no business using because it's obvious he doesn't know how it works. The guy asks and he says, yeah. He goes into the gun range and he's whistling to himself. Then you see him slowly putting up a poster and it's going back and reclining and it reveals that it's a dog. <laughs> There's so much depth in this. It's so ridiculous. And shooting around the dog because my boy's range is not really it. The other two men who were happily shooting before their targets slowly stop, come over to him and ask him what he's doing. And at first he's like, wait, what, me? I love the innocence of Darius. It never gets old. He says, I'm just shooting this dog. You can't do that. My children are here. And I'm thinking, sir, why are your kids at the gun range? But oh wait, I forget, as a Canadian, it's the American way. Then they get into this discourse. Darius tells the men, you don't know about the dogs in my neighborhood. They're bad, they bite babies. And before he can even continue, the men cut him off and say, no, you can't shoot dogs. And then that's when he kind of questions, well, what about shooting people? That's also bad too, and that one's quite personal. And he points over to the one that says dad, and I just, Alana, you're so wrong for that. And then out of nowhere, a shorter man comes out, and he's taking Darius' side, like, 
you guys can't tell us what to do, basically the whole sentiment of a free country. And then he goes as far to say, I saw you the other day shooting a Mexican with a knife. I said, well, that got Reese's real quick, but also very relevant because this was before Trump's America, which we could talk about that for days. And then he goes off even deeper to the point where Darius is like, no, no, I didn't say all of that because <laughs> he was basically talking about a revolution. I was like, wow, that escalated real quick. But of course, as the world is, Darius is the one that gets kicked out at gunpoint. He asks for his ID back and then he asks back for the poster and they won't give him it. The symbolism in this scene is clear. Many people, people I personally known as well, regard animal lives in the form of pets higher than human life. People, I will never get that. I'm not a pet person. I know a lot of people who have pets. I think they're cute. I'll rub a belly or two when I'm over at someone's house. Then I want that in my house, okay? Where my mom was born, they're called yard dogs for a reason because you keep them in the yard. Of course, in Antigua, it's hot so they can stay out year round. I wouldn't get one in Canada because I don't want one in my house. But that's another story for another day. I'm sharing this to say that I live in a community, a neighborhood, and even this building where I'm one of few people that doesn't have a pet. And I've heard so many conversations about the love of dogs and cats. I get it, it's a companion, but at the same time, so many people are willing to value that life higher than another human's life. And it's always been baffling to me. So much to the point where I was walking with a friend a couple weeks ago and we passed a couple dogs because there's dogs everywhere around here. Oh my God, I love that dog. And then we passed a homeless person. He asked for money. I said, sorry, I don't have any change on me. And she's like, scum of the earth. And I was so confused because I was like, where was all the, like, wait, what? I'm of the mindset that you never know how someone got to where they are, so don't judge them. Maybe he made a couple bad decisions. Maybe he's dealing with dementia. Maybe he has drug abuse. Maybe his family abandoned. Whatever it is, he got to the place of being homeless. And I wouldn't wish that on anyone. I don't want to know how he got there. I just want to impart sympathy and compassion because I would never want to be there or wish anyone I'd love to be there. And I was just so shocked at the jarring shift in a short walk between love for the pets versus this person who maybe is down on their luck or made bad decisions, whatever it may be. But a lot of people in this community think that way where they really prioritize pets over people. And I, keeping it real, I don't get it. I think they're cute, they're fluffy little fur balls. Again, due to hygiene reasons, I wouldn't want one in my house. I'd rather give money if I had that much excess because pets are not cheap to a charity, but that's, again, another story for another day. But I thought it was a very good illustration of how these gun-toting Americans are trying to hold the line of what is reasonable and right in the gun range and also what their values are. And I think it speaks to so many things, which I, as a Canadian, feel like I don't have the right to say. I ain't trying to go down that rabbit hole here on YouTube where the censorship is real, but there's a lot, there's a lot. So I'm gonna wrap it up on that note. I hope that you guys enjoyed this one. I try to make this episode more than what it was, or maybe I did see it for what it was. Either way, I hope you enjoyed it. And until next time, stay safe, stay sane, stay blessed. Love and later.